Hey, welcome to First Church. If you're new, my name's Chad, and we are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. And before we get started in the message today, I'm not sure you guys are aware of this, but there's a pretty big day coming up. Election Day is happening here in a couple days, and I would like for us as a church just to take a moment and go to our Heavenly Father in prayer and lift up our nation. So if you would, let's take a few minutes just to do that. If you would bow with me in prayer. Father, we just want to pause right now in this moment before we go any further in this message and just lift up our nation to you. Father, this Tuesday, we will come together and we will vote. I know many have already voted across our country, but Father, we just pray that we would vote in such a way that would please you, that Father would, uh, that we could express our Christian morals and principles through the way that we vote. And Father, we know that even on its worst day, America is still the greatest country in the world. And so no matter what happens, no matter what the outcome is, may we be an example of your love and your grace and your kindness to this world. May we show people that no matter what happens, no matter who's in the White House or who's in Congress, Father, you are on the throne. You are in control and we are serving you. So Father, I just lift up this great nation that we live in as we vote this Tuesday. And Father, may we carry out your will. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Thank you, appreciate you guys letting me have a chance to do that. Well, we have a ton of people here on site at North Carolina worshiping with us. I know we have a ton of people worshiping with us from other states and countries. So if you guys would here in person, would you put your hands together? Welcome in our online family. So glad to have you guys today here as well. And I want to start off today by asking a question, and it's this. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Think about that for a second. What's the biggest risk that you've ever taken? Now, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it was some business venture or investment that you made. Maybe the biggest risk that you've ever taken was asking somebody out on a date for the first time, maybe asking your spouse to marry you. Maybe that was a big risk. Maybe for you, it was moving to a new town or new city, someplace you've never been before. Maybe it's going off to college for the first time and living by yourself. Maybe for you, what was your biggest risk was doing something crazy like skydiving or going whitewater rafting or bungee jumping or maybe even riding a roller coaster for the very first time like this 78-year-old Swedish grandma. I'll take a look at this video. I love it. I don't think her hair moved the entire time, did it? But she was worried about it. You know, a few weeks ago, my family had the chance to go to Silver Dollar City theme park in Branson, Missouri. And my son, Alex, is a risk taker. He rode with me every single roller coaster at Silver Dollar City. And we had an absolute blast. There were several of those rides that we rode multiple times. Here's a picture of Alex and me on one of those rides. And we had fun. We had to wear masks the entire time, but we still had fun. By the way, there's my first church mask. So I was still promoting you guys and our church family here. But we had so much fun. But there was one ride in particular that Alex was a little bit nervous about. I could tell. I never said anything because I didn't want to scare him even more. But he was nervous, a little anxious. And I just tell us we were waiting in line for the ride. He was scared. So we finally got on the ride. It took off. And he had fun. He had a blast. And we got off of it. And he was just jumping up and down, you know, because he loved it. And I was like, buddy, I know you had fun. But you were scared a little bit, weren't you? You were scared when we were waiting in line. He was just like, yeah, daddy, I was. But it was so worth it in the end. And, you know, I think that's why we take risk in life. Because the reward, we think, is worth it. We'll take a risk when we believe that the reward is worth it. When the potential payoff to us is worth more than the potential loss, we'll take a risk. You may have never thought about it, but I think this statement is definitely true. We'll take a risk when we believe the risk is worth the potential reward. Hang on to that for just a second. We're going to come back to it here in just a minute. 
We're in a series right now called Coming Home. We launched a series last Sunday, and in this series, we're looking at what's been called the most famous story ever told. It's the story of the prodigal son found in Luke chapter 15, and here's the thing. It may or may not be the most famous story ever told in your opinion, but it's definitely the most famous parable that Jesus ever shared with his followers. It is a story about a father who has two sons, and both of those sons end up rebelling against him, and that's why last Sunday, when we launched this series, and we we talked about how most people call this parable the parable of the prodigal son. I said that actually a better name for this parable is probably the parable of a father's relentless love. Because even though, yes, the younger son of this father, he did run off to a far country and waste his father's money and rebel against him. And the older son, he also rebelled against his dad at the end of the story. Really, the main character throughout the entire parable is the father because the father continues to love his kids, even when they rebel against him, even when they run from him, even when, even when they disgrace and embarrass him. The story is all about the Father. And what Jesus here is trying to do is paint for us a more accurate picture of who our God is. Because Jesus tells this story, Luke chapter 15, 1 tells us, he tells this story because there were some people criticizing him. See, Jesus is hanging out with people who have sinful reputations, Luke refers to them as tax collectors and notorious sinners. He's hanging out with these people, and the religious elite of his day don't like the fact that he is hanging out with these sinful people. So basically what I said last week was Jesus is hanging out with people who are not okay, and those who think that they're okay are not okay with it. They're not okay with him hanging out with this scum, these notorious sinners, in their mind at least. And so Jesus says the reason why you're thinking that is because you have the wrong picture of God. See, this is how the religious people in Jesus' day picture God. They picture God more like a scorekeeper, as this cosmic scorekeeper up in the heavens who's weighing our good and bad deeds, keeping track of every good and bad thing that we do, and the hope is that, the, that by the time you die, you will have done more good deeds than bad deeds in the scorekeeper's eyes. And honestly, that's not far removed from how a lot of people see God and picture God today, is it? It's all about doing enough good works, good deeds to earn God's favor. And Jesus says, no, no, that's not how God works. Jesus comes on the scene with a much different picture of God, and it's not the picture of a scorekeeper. It's the picture of a father, a father who relentlessly loves his children, a father who loves his kids even when his kids don't return love to him. A father who never gives up on his kids, even when his kids have given up on him. A father who has his children's best interest at heart. And here's the thing. Jesus wants to present this picture of God because he knows something. He knows a key truth. He knows this, that how we see God, that determines how we live life. Because if you see God every single day as this scorekeeper who's just keeping track of our rights and wrongs, of this referee in the sky who's ready to blow his whistle every time we mess up and strike us down, if that's your picture of God, then you're going to live in fear of him. But if you, if you see God as a father, a father who relentlessly loves you, a father who has your best interests at heart, a father who wants you to live your best life, you will live differently. You will respond differently to him. And so Jesus presents this new picture of God, God as Father. And that's why we're looking at the parable of the prodigal son because Jesus tells three parables to actually redefine God. And the last parable he tells, the longest one of the three, is what we call the prodigal son or what I'm calling a parable of a father's relentless love. And in this parable, Jesus goes through and explains how God responds to us. And I know what some people are thinking. The prodigal son, again, I mean, we're doing a whole series on the prodigal son. I mean, I've heard the prodigal son over and over again. I've grown up in church. I've heard it over and over again. We're going to look at the prodigal son again. Yeah, we are. You know why? Because I believe that one parable captures the entire story of God. I believe it captures the heart and the nature of of God, the character of our God, better than probably any other story in Scripture. And here's the thing. I have studied the parable of the prodigal son numerous, numerous times throughout my life, both personally, professionally, academically, and every time that I come back to this parable, I learn something new about God. I learn something new about people. I learn something new about me. And so whether this is your maiden voyage through the prodigal son or if this is your 50th stroll down memory lane, my prayer for you today is the same. I pray 
that you will come to know God's love in a very real and personal way as we study about him from this famous parable that Jesus told. So last week, Jesus starts off this parable in Luke chapter 15, and we looked at it, and Jesus says that there was this father, the main character of the parable, there's this father who had two sons. And so let's pick up where we left off last week, and let's see what this younger son does. Read with me, if you would, Luke 15, verse 12. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Give me my inheritance, basically. So he divided his property, the father did, between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered, wasted his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So we talked about this a little bit last week. You see, when this son comes to his dad and says, Dad, I want you to give me my share of the inheritance. I want you to give me my part, even though you're not dead yet. This was this son basically saying, God, I mean, saying, Father, I wish you were dead. Dad, I wish you were already dead. In other words, he's saying, Dad, I love your stuff more than I love you. Dad, I love what you can do for me more than I love you. I believe that you're in my way. I think there's more for me out there beyond what you can offer me, and you're just in my way, and I want to get you out of the way. I love what you can do for me, what you can give me more than I actually love you. And can you imagine the pain that this dad would have experienced when he heard those words? It was not just embarrassing in that day and age, that's embarrassing in any culture. And I know right now in this room, or those of you who are worshiping at home, I know right now some of you guys, unfortunately from experience, know what it's like to love someone and have that love unreturned. Know what it's like to love someone and have that love unappreciated. In my opinion, there is no greater pain. There's no greater heartache than unreturned, unappreciated love especially you parents who've experienced that. As a guardian and a protector and provider of a child who has lavished love on that child and wanted the best for that child, and then to have that child not return love to you, there's nothing more crushing. There's nothing more disheartening. There's nothing more painful. I remember several years ago I had I had a meeting with uh, some parents in my church, a couple in my church, whose daughter had gone off to college and just gone wild. She was a good kid, good student, made good grades, all that stuff. She was a good church girl, was in the church youth group and whatever else, but she went off to college and just went wild. She spent a bunch of her parents' money without them realizing it. She got into a group of friends that were doing drugs. She flunked out of school. And at that point, when I was meeting with these parents, they didn't know where their daughter was. They didn't know if she was in prison or not. They didn't know what state she was in. They didn't have a clue at that moment where she was. And I remember when they wanted to meet with me, me thinking, you know, they're going to be frustrated and mad and hurt. And when I sat down with them and looked at them in the eye, the only thing that I saw in that moment was pain. I could see the pain in their eyes. I could hear it in their voice. And I'll never forget what they said to me. Say, Chad, we just want our girl to know that we love her and that she's always welcome back home. Can you imagine the pain that the father in the parable of the prodigal son felt when his son came to him and said, Dad, I wish you were dead. I'd rather have your stuff than have you. I love what you can do for me more than I love you. And here's the thing, in this culture, in this day and age, this dad would have been expected in that very moment to disown his son. That's what all of his neighbors would have expected him to do because for the dad not to disown his son, that would have been a disgrace upon the father. See, this father was expected to either punish the son or force his son to continue to live on the land, live on the family estate as a servant at this point. He was supposed to punish the son and disown him as a member of the family but still make him stay there as a servant 
serve in either that or have him thrown in prison or maybe even stoned for his rebellion. That's what everyone else expected him to do. And yet, this dad doesn't do that. Jesus says that this dad, upon the son's request, look at what this dad does. Luke chapter 15 tells us that this dad divided his property between them just as the younger son had asked. And my question is, why? Why did the dad do this? See, every single time that I preach or teach on this passage, that's the number one question that I get. Why did the dad let the son go? Why did the dad do what the son asked? Why did he divide up the estate and give the son his part? Why? In fact, I was meeting with my small group this past Wednesday night, and this question came up, and I get it. I've asked this question before too. Why? Why did the dad do it? Why didn't the dad make the son stay? He could have. Why didn't he punish him? Why didn't he force him to remain a servant on the estate? The dad knew what this son was going to do. Why did he do it? Because this father in our parable, remember, represents God. And this dad knew something. This dad knew that by forcing his son to stay on the estate would only drive his son further away from him. It would only further deny him his son's love. Because this dad knew Forced love isn't real love. And the Bible repeatedly teaches this. Forced love isn't real love. Love, any type of love, is always a choice that we make. And forced love, that's not real love, that's fake. God could have designed us to be robots, but he didn't. He wanted a relationship with us. And in order to have a meaningful relationship with someone, it has to be a choice. This was a lesson that I learned years ago, not necessarily from the Bible, but I learned about watching soap operas with my grandma. I remember during the summers, I would spend a week or two with my grandma, and we would always watch soap operas during lunch. And I have no idea why they call them soap operas, because they're kind of dirty, actually, but she refers to them as her stories. And I love my grandma to death. She's now in her upper 80s. She's not doing real well, but I remember those, I remember watching her soaps. And Every single summer when I would come back, you know, I wouldn't watch a soap opera during the interim period, but every single summer when I come back for a week or two and stay with them, there was the same storyline going on over and over again. And you guys probably know this if you watch one of these shows. There was always this girl who is in love. At least she thought she was in love with this guy, this dude, but the dude didn't love her. And so she tried every way in the world to get him to fall in love with her. And she would try to trick him and seduce him and fool him and woo him. And she would try to do all this stuff, come up with all these schemes, try to get him to fall in love with her. But he always loved somebody else, right? And he would never fall for it. But eventually, she might have some success. And she might trick him into asking her out or spending some time with her. She might trick him into even getting married to her. But it never worked out in the end because you can't force love. Love is always a choice. And that guy always ended up with the one he chose to love. And that's the same when it comes to us and the Bible us and God. God could have forced us to love him, but he knew that type of relationship would have been empty, would have been superficial, would have been a charade. He didn't want that. He didn't want a bunch of robots. He wanted a relationship. And this dad in the parable, he knew that too. He knew that only, only by the son wanting to be with his father would their relationship be made meaningful. And God knows that as well. See, I often tell people that the biggest risk that God ever took is found in Genesis chapter two. Remember this, when God was creating everything? In Genesis chapter two, he puts the human race in the garden of Eden. And look at what the Bible says in Genesis two, verse nine. It says, the Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, the garden of Eden, this paradise, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God tells Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because if you do, then sin's gonna enter the world, sin's gonna enter your lives, the curse of death is gonna be upon you and the entire world. Don't do it, trust me. I have provided you with this awesome paradise and you can eat from any other tree in the garden, but don't eat from this tree. If you do, it's gonna mess everything up. And we all know what Adam and Eve did, right? And my question is, why did he put that tree in the garden? He didn't have to. He could have created the Garden of Eden without the tree of knowledge of good of evil. 
He could have created without that tree that messed everything up, right? He put it there because he wanted to give us a choice because he knew forced love isn't real love. See, God knew. God knew that if we were going to have a meaningful relationship with him, it had to be a choice. And so that's why I'll say it again. The biggest risk that God ever took was putting the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden of Eden because he wanted us to want him. He wanted us to see our need for him. He didn't want a bunch of robots. God knew, like the father in the parable, the prodigal son, God knew that only by us wanting to be with him would our relationship with him be meaningful. And let me look at this from a different perspective as well. When it comes to this younger son in our parable, where did his long road to ruin begin? I mean, think about it. Where did his long road to ruin begin? It didn't begin when he reached the far country, the distant land. It didn't begin when he went to his dad and said, Dad, give me my share of the inheritance. No, it began long, long before that. It began in his heart, long before he ever asked his father for his share of the estate. See, that's why Jeremiah says, Jeremiah says in the Old Testament, says the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is exceedingly corrupt. This is why anytime somebody comes to me and says, hey, Chad, I'm just following my heart, I get a little nervous because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is exceedingly, exceedingly corrupt. See, our hearts, our emotions, our feelings can lead us astray, and that's why we've got to let God direct our hearts because our hearts left on their own, they're deceitful. They will lead us away from the life that God wants us to live. And that's what's happening to this younger son in our passage. In his heart, he has already determined that there is something better for him outside of his father. And so he's going to stop at nothing to get it. He's already determined that, and so he is ready to go. Now, physically, he may still be at home at one point, but his heart was already in the distant land. And that's why the moment he got the opportunity to run, he jumped at it. He took it. And let me hit pause here just for a second. Guys, for some of us, the only reason why we haven't wandered off to the distant land, the only reason why we haven't wandered off to a life of sin is not because of our deep love for God, but it's because of a lack of opportunity. It's because we haven't had the chance yet to actually do it. Let me speak to some of you students that may be listening today. Some of you guys have grown up being the good student, the good kid, the good church-going kid. You've got a great reputation right now, and that's awesome. But in your heart, you're already thinking about what's it going to be like when you move out, when you're on your own, when you go to college. And you're already thinking, there's some stuff I'm going to do that I wouldn't do when I'm at home with mom and dad. Some of you men in the room, the only reason why you haven't jumped into the bed of somebody you're not married to yet is because the right woman hasn't propositioned you yet. But when she does, things might just change. Some of you ladies, the only reason why you haven't had an affair yet is because that ex-boyfriend hasn't direct messaged you online yet. But when he does, things will change. For right now, you're just left to a life of romance novels and watching Fifty Shades of Grey over and over again. But one day, some of you guys and gals alike who are in business, the only reason why you haven't made a corrupt, shady business deal yet is because the right opportunity hasn't come along. And the list goes on and on and on. You see, when you believe there is something better for you outside of the Father, you will stop at nothing to get it. It's only a matter of time before you run to go get it. And that's the prodigal in this passage. His heart was in the distant country before he ever left the father's estate. And that's why the dad has to let him go. Because by forcing him to stay there, his heart would just get further and further away from his dad. And so what does the father do? He takes a risk. And he says, the only way that my son is going to want to be here is if I let him go. And the potential reward is worth it. 
So he let him go. And we know what happens. The, this boy goes off to the distant land. He blows all of his father's money. There's a famine in the land, and he's left with absolutely nothing. And so none of his new friends that he made in this distant country will help him out. None of these ladies that he's been with will help him out. Nobody will assist him. Nobody will help him. He's on his own, and he's hungry. And so what he decides to do is to sell himself as a servant to a pig farmer. And if you know anything about ancient Jewish culture, you know there was no more degrading position than to be a pig farmer are to take care of pigs because pigs were the most unclean, dirty animal that existed on the face of the planet and this guy is feeding the pigs and it starts to hit him that the pigs that he's feeding have a better life than he has. And so read and see what happens here in Luke chapter 15. The passage goes on to say that when he came to his senses, man, you ever been there before? When he came to his senses, You ever had one of those moments when the light bulb comes on and the fog lifts, the cobwebs come down and you realize I was created for more than this pigsty that I've been living in? You ever been there? I have. And he said to himself, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. See, this son, he understands the culture of his day. There is no way he could ever be accepted back in as a member of the family. He has lost his identity as a son forever. No amount of payment could be made for him to be welcomed back into the family. But maybe, just maybe, if his dad was gracious enough and loving enough, maybe his dad would let him stay on the estate as a hired servant. Maybe he would let him live there because even his father's servants were living better than what he was currently living And so he knows that repercussions have to be made. He knows that he has to pay a price for this sin that he has committed, this embarrassment that he has caused against his family. And so he goes back to his dad and he begs his dad, hey, restitution needs to be made here, dad. And so I'm here and I'm willing to be your servant. Just let me live on your land. I know that a lifetime of serving you won't repay what I've done to you. I get it. I know there's nothing I can do to earn my place back in the family estate. But if you would just be gracious and loving, and let me work. I will work the rest of my life as your servant just so I can be close to you. And as the son is pleading with his father, Jesus tells a story and Jesus says it's as if the dad doesn't even hear what his son is saying. Instead, the dad just does this. It says in Luke chapter 15, it says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This dad hears his son pleading to be welcomed back in as a servant. And you know what this dad does? This dad says, I'm not going to let you be one of my servants. I'm going to reestablish you as one of my sons. I'm going to make you my son again. See, in this day and age, the father was the patriarch of the entire family. He represented the entire family, the values, the morals of the family. And only the father had the right to adopt somebody into the family. And the father could adopt anybody. We have historical records of fathers adopting slaves to be part of their family because the slave represented the spirit and the character of the family. And they wanted to honor that. So this dad has the right to adopt anybody back in to his family but here's the thing by this dad doing this he would have been shamed by the rest of his neighbors the rest of his neighbors would have looked down upon him he would have this would have been a disgraceful deed they would have shook their heads and say that's not right this isn't justice this isn't what should be this is wrong this is a bad example for all other sons that are out there this is not good This dad would have been ostracized. This dad would have been looked down upon. He would have been criticized by his neighbors. And yet this dad doesn't care. Because it was worth whatever he had to sacrifice. It was worth whatever he had to give up in order to have his son back home again. You see, this dad, 
He never questioned the son's identity. The son does. The son forgets who he is. The neighbors do. The neighbors have already treated this boy as if he's dead to them, but not the dad. The dad never questioned his son's identity. He knew who his son was. And so when his son comes back home and is repentant and wants to be part of the family again, the dad says, I'm not going to let you be a servant. I'm going to give you what only I can give you. I'm going to give you something you don't deserve, something you can't earn, something you could never work for. I'm going to give you the status of being my son again. And he writes him back into the will. And guys, this is a picture of the cross. Because on the cross, God sent his only son to stand in our place, to pay a price that we couldn't pay because no amount of good deeds, no amount of work could ever earn our place back into the family of God because we had sinned, we had messed up, we had blown it, we had fallen short of God's glory and nothing that we could do could get our way, could earn our way back to God. And yet God said, I can make a way. I'll provide a way because you're still my child and I love you and I'll make the sacrifice, I'll do whatever it takes to get you back home with me. I have a friend who preaches in the central Kentucky area and I've heard him tell the story multiple times about one day he was driving home from the office and his wife called him and his wife said, you won't believe what your son did. And as a dad, any time my wife, Allison, says that to me, I'm like, he's your son too, but she still says that anyway. And so this, this friend of mine's wife said, you won't believe what your son did. My friend's like, okay, what'd he do? And she said, you'll see when you get home. You'll see as soon as you drive, pull into the driveway. And so my friend just waited. He eventually got home, and he saw what his boy had done about a block away from his house. He looked at his driveway, and there his son on their driveway had got a can of orange spray paint, and this son had spray painted a giant X all the way across their driveway. And my friend said, in my son's defense, we had been out playing with chalk a day or two before that, so maybe he thought it was just going to wash off like the chalk did. But as you guys know, spray paint doesn't wash off. And my buddy said, this X was huge. I mean, it was the size, if you want to try to land the space shuttle, that's the size of X you would have painted. And that's what this boy did. So there, in their new home on the driveway, was this huge, giant, orange, spray-painted X. And so my friend pulled in, got out of the car. His wife and son are standing there, and his son's just crying because he knows he's messed up. I guess, his, I guess his mom had already let him have it. My friend walks up to his son, and his son is saying, Daddy, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And by that time, the boy ran back into the house, and my friend didn't know where he went. He just thought maybe he was embarrassed, but he came back out a few minutes later, and his son had in the, palm of his, in the palms of his hands, he had just some one dollar bills and some change, his entire life savings. And he said, here daddy, will this pay to fix it? Will this pay to fix it? And my friend said there was probably like, you know, eight bucks in there or something, you know, there was nothing in his hand. He said, nobody, that's not enough to fix it. And his son just put his head down and just started to cry. And in that moment, my friend got down on his knees, put his arm around his boy. And he said, you don't have enough money to fix it, but your daddy does. I still love you, you messed up, don't ever play with spray paint again, <laughs> but I still love you, you're still my son, your daddy will fix it. So my friend went to Lowe's and asked what he needed to do and they gave him, you know, like a wheelbarrow full of still wool, you know, to go out there and do some work and he went out there for hours and worked on the driveway and eventually got the X up. And for weeks after that, my friend's son would go out to the driveway when friends or company would come over and he would say, hey, look, that's where I painted that big X, but it's not there anymore, it's gone now. And anybody who would come over to the house would say, how'd you get it up? And my friend's son would say, I didn't do it. My daddy did it. He's the only one who could fix it. Guys, I don't know what your X is today. I don't know what the X is that you've painted on your life right now. I don't know what this X represents for you. 
I don't know what you've done in your past. I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what's going on in your heart right now. And maybe you haven't run from God yet, but you're tempted to in your heart. I don't know where you are right now or where you've been. I don't know what this X represents for you, but I know one thing. The X doesn't have to remain. It doesn't have to stay. You can't get rid of it on your own. You don't have enough good works, deeds, money, resources in the world to get rid of the X that's on your life right now. But we have a father who does. And we have a father who loves you, who relentlessly loves you as you are. And he wants to look at you right now and say, I can take care of this if you'll just come home to me. Guys, I don't know where you are right now, but I know one thing. You have a father who loves you. Don't run from him. Don't keep running from him. Come home, and he will wash you clean today. If you need a fresh start, if you need a second chance, if you need to start over, that's why Jesus died, and you can have that today. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you so much, and we are undeserving of your love. And Father, I just want to speak for myself. I am not here today because I am afraid of you or because I'm obligated to be here or because I'm trying to earn my way to you. Father, I am here today because I love you, and I know how much you love me, and I don't deserve it, but you lavish your love upon me, and the same is true for every single person sitting in this room or watching online right now. Father, we love you, and we are so grateful for the love that you have shown us. And if there's anyone right now who is living in a distant land or who has lived in a distant land, Father, don't let them leave today with an X still on their life. Father, you're welcoming them home. You're ready to ride them back into the wheel. You're ready to make them, declare them your child again. So Father, may we all come home to you today. In the name of Jesus, I pray.